My name is DJ Semsex. Um, the DJ, broadcaster, podcaster, author, fan of hip hop. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. Like you know. <laughs> Music, Michael Jackson, off the wall album. My mum, my mum used to play that all the time. Like, I, I was brainwashed onto that when I was a kid. Um, but, but hip hop, I'd say it was like Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick the show. Um, that was like my brother introduced me to that, and that was just like mind blowing at the time. I mean, my brother, he, he, he got me into it basically. He, you know, it was like, it was like a time where. You know, there's, there's certain moments in history where music just captures a generation from one way or the other. And I think that period, it was like, it was Public Enemy, um, Yo Bumnos watched the show, it was um, LL Cool J, Bad, um, and it was all of those records. And it was like, all of a sudden, it took over his life. And then me being a little brother, that, influenced me so I was looking up to him and I was looking up to what he was listening to and he just caught me in the same way basically. I was the kind of kid that um, I grinded for everything like I worked for everything. I, di I didn't come from a wealthy family and that's no disrespect to my parents who's a working class family. My parents were hard working and I had twin sisters and a brother so it was very it was you know it was one of them moments it was one of those things where we had to go out into the world and figure it out. So me wanting to be a DJ, you know, it wasn't like asking my mom and dad for a set of turntables. Like I had to work for that. I had to um, get what I could afford. So the first set of turntables that I bought, oh, they were horrible. Like it's called a Stanton belt drive. And you really can't DJ on them. It's just two turntables and it's just like, and then it was like a, a cam mixer and I, and I took it from there and I was really like trying hard to do what I'd seen on, you know, at that time on TV or what I'd seen on music videos. And, and it was just, it's only when you get the worst turntables that you're like, All right, I need these Technics ones that everybody uses, which is, you know, the, the standard model, but they're, they're crazy expensive, like at that time, you know, when, when you're a kid and you're working in stores or you're doing a paper round or stuff like that. It's like, you really, you know, it's, it's kind of like you get what you can, basically. But I managed to get, I managed to get, <laughs> I managed to get my first set of Technic 1210s from a guy who did, um, you know, some kind of fraud situation. Somehow he got hold of them. Somehow I got them in my room for a quarter of the price. And from there, you know, I was on my way from that point. Now, how does that evolve into actually radio now? Like going in there, because then again, you're doing parties, I'm assuming, and everything else, and behind different artists and everything else. How does that transfer you into like getting in front of it, like becoming more of a personality? I mean, it's, it, it started out from going to the youth club, going to parties and not hearing what I wanted to hear. So I was providing the music. I was walking into parties with records like, oh yeah, yeah, play this, you know what I mean? Or like, and, and it was like, because it, it was totally different from the way it is now. Now somebody just passed the ox, you know, now it's like someone's got a go-to playlist or something or everybody wants to hear what they want to hear. So it was, it was, I was providing the music. I was selecting, I didn't know it at the time, but that's what I was doing. I was already selecting tracks. So I'd go to the youth club, I'd go to parties, I go to college parties and I turn up with the records and everything, and that's what turned into DJing. You know, I went from doing stuff like that to being an official bedroom DJ. Now, when you're the bedroom DJ, your imagination goes wild. You're imagining what it's like to be in front of a crowd. You're imagining you have visions of yourself rocking a club. You know, it's so self-indulgent. You know, it's kind of pathetic and it's kind of you know narcissistic. But that's what you do when you're coming up. You just you just want to move the crowd as a DJ. So I had all these dreams, all these big ideas and everything else. And then it, it comes out of a, how can I be heard? How can I put across this dope new music that I want people to discover? 
how can I amplify this? How can I show what I can do on the turntables and show my selection abilities? So that started off as mixtapes. And then from doing the mixtapes, we had this thing over here called Pirate Radio, which is like a legal radio station. Legal radio stations, they, they, they were never going to put me on. Like, I, I, you know, I didn't have a brand that was popping. They didn't rate the music that I represented or anything like that. They just wanted to play dance music. They just wanted to play all this other stuff. So for me, it was like, I need to get on a pirate station. And even with pirate stations, even though they're illegal and even though they embrace the sounds that you represent or whatever, it's still hard to get on one. You can't just decide you want to DJ and get on one. So because I was popping with the mixtapes in my area, um, there was these two rasters who had a station called Ari FM. And they, they rated me. They just loved my energy and everything. And they were like, yeah, Zeb says Wagwa. They, they, they were just like, yeah, just come on our station. And it was a reggae station, a hardcore reggae station. And, and I did a hip hop show there. I had no business being on that station. It, it just didn't make sense. But I did it for the practice. I did it for the, the chance to be heard. I did it to just, I'm a DJ on the station. I'm making moves, I'm making progress. And that's how it started. And I, and I feel like, you know, the underground radio, legal radio, yo, cherish that. Because, you know, it does so much for the communities or communities that they're based in that people don't realize. And at that time, it was definitely more important then than it is now. But I learned so much coming up through that network. I started on Ari FM and then I went on to Love Energy and that's when I really became my own as a broadcaster. But I had no intention of speaking. I was the DJ that mixed with his hand. You know what I mean? It was like, I was like, I just wanted to be like the silent DJ, like Terminator Rex. And it was, um, it wasn't until the BBC approached me about doing something. There was a guy called Ray Paul and he encouraged me to talk. And that's, that's when I started doing it. And, I'm sure he regrets it for the rest of his life, but that's how my career in radio side. When I heard the song, I loved it. I appreciated the the, the 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 shout out that they gave me in the song, but even more so, what I did love about the record, them dudes could really spit. Like the punchline game was was clever. The metaphors was clever. The pocket, the way they sit in. The beat they just remind me of some yard man you know what i'm saying and and it was like it just the feeling in the way that they married that beat was just something that was unquestionable to me so the record was just dope in itself well basically with the podcast i'm 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 getting that perspective i'm getting that uk perspective with the greatest artists you know whether they're established and you know they're further on in the career or whether they're at the beginning of the career and it's it's in-depth conversation I'm, I'm trying to get the stories i'm trying to get the detail I'm, I'm not trying to get i'm not trying to go for um the nonsense i don't do that so it's just it's just i'm just playing my part in documenting the culture from from my perspective so and i know there's a lot of podcasts and i know there's a lot of great people who do things um you know across the world but um this I'm, I'm different. I've got my own perspective. I'm a different person. And yeah, it's just celebrating the culture. It continues, you know? If you give me that, yeah, 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 yeah. Baby, give me that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go show you that, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you give me that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Baby, give me that, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we've all been raised on hip hop to a certain point. If you're a fan of hip hop, it's raised you some way. I mean, someone asked me on Reddit the other day, you know, you know, how did your parents feel? I, of course my parents raised me. Of course, like, I, you know, they did their best to bring me up and everything else. But musically, you know, what I learned from Public Enemy was the art of graphic design, the importance of the imagery. And I already knew that from when I was doing the graffiti side of things and, and tagging in the streets and everything else but the iconography of what they did you know with the logo with the lettering and everything else and then you know you see it in the album then you see it in the posters when you turn up in the show and then you see it on stage that taught me marketing you know it, it taught me taught me how to market it taught me how to you know indirectly promote my own shows my own events and everything else and then when I moved up, when I started working with labels, it, you know, how to market artists and everything else. And then not only that, it's just, 
you know, the, the, the music that I grew up on, Public Enemy, Jungle Brothers, Tribe Called Quest and, and everything else, there was an, and KRS-One, BDP, there was an educational aspect to it that was never taught in schools. You know, what they were talking about. I, di I, didn't, I didn't learn about Marcus Garvey in school. I learned that from Public Enemy. You know, I learned, I learned about Malcolm X through Public Enemy. I learned about Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad and everything else through hip hop. I learned about race relations through Jungle Brothers. You know, when I was living in a racist area and, and getting called the N word and everything else and this, this, that and the other. I didn't know what was going on. Like it wasn't, it is, it's, it's very, it's very, um, it was a very, people are in very isolated situations. And I think, you know, music brings us together. And I think hip hop has done that better than any other genre, you know? And, and when I look back at it, it has, you know, from everything from me wanting to be a DJ and wanting to work in the music industry, from everything that I've done, um, in some capacity, I've, I've, I've done it and I've been fortunate to be able to work with a lot of artists. And, you know, we're going back to what you were saying at the beginning of this conversation, you're talking about DJing. I've done, I've pretty much done every facet of DJing from mixtapes to the tour DJ for eight years, to the festival DJ, to the, the radio DJ. I do it all. And I think you have to be, to be able to be a great DJ. You've got to be able to do all of them things. And most of the people that I look up to um, as DJs, they've done that, you know, they've done that several times over and they keep evolving and keep doing things and everything else. So it's, it is definitely raised me and it's definitely, um, changed my life. And it's definitely the most innovative and constantly evolving art form. It's exciting, you know, so doing, being able to do a book, it was the least I could do to document my experience and what I've seen and and what these artists have mean to the UK as well because it's is you know in America you guys live with it. You guys it's on your doorstep. You you've grown up in it. You know, if you live in the Bronx, you were born in in the Mecca of hip hop. Whereas over here, when you see an announcement that that new favorite act is coming to town, that's a big deal. No matter how old you are. No matter what age or what point you are in life. When your favorite artist is coming to town, it's like, it's, it's a gas. You've got to be there. You've got to be at that show. You've got to experience it. And then a super fan goes a step further. A super fan becomes a DJ or becomes a journalist or something else. And then they actually have the privilege of getting close to that artist and interviewing them when they're in town and or being a part of it or working with them or anything. So there's kind of an appreciation over here that is different to what you've got over there. But there's also, there's a historical legacy of what artists have done over here that may not have been presented. You know, like what Della Soul have done over here, what, what you know, what Public Enemy have done over here, right up to what Drake's doing over here today. You know, it's, it's always evolving. And I think, you know, we've got our own history and our own relationship with hip hop. So it was, I'm privileged to be able to write about that. I'm, I'm everywhere online. It's at DJ Semtex on everything, on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse, Facebook, um, Reddit, um, and the podcast is available on every streaming platform. It's like, it's really easy to find Hip Hop Rage News pretty much everywhere documented. So it, it's, it's, it's very easy to tap in um, across the board. Yo, my name is DJ Semtex, and I've just been buzzed.